take the roll call, please, Debbie. Chairman Beyer. Uh, present. Councilor Barry. Here. Councilor Fritz. Here. Councilor Groff. Here. Councilor McGinty. Here. Councilor Reed. Here. And Councilor Watson. Here. Thank you. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you. I'm going to take the uh, opportunity to move one thing out of order on the agenda and move directly to presentations. I believe the uh, girls' high school tennis team is here, and uh, Sue Ray. Is Sue here? Great. Come on up, please, everyone. Come on up, please. Great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Come on up, everyone. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Step right up here where the cameras are. I want to take the opportunity to present uh, this award, and actually, I should read it. In order to read it, I Whereas the Cape Elizabeth girls tennis team recently earned their ninth consecutive Maine Class B state tennis championship and are now a 9 for 9 in the 90s. And whereas winning the final game was against an unbeaten team and was the culmination of another successful season for this team with a 16-0 record this year, following an identical record in the 1997 championship season, and whereas the team won the final meet in a come-from-behind victory that showed the confidence the team had in its abilities, and whereas the entire Cape Elizabeth community is proud of the accomplishments of the members of this team, now therefore be it resolved by the Cape Elizabeth Town Council that we hereby congratulate the Cape Elizabeth Girls Tennis State Champions and we praise them <coughs> for the honor they have earned for themselves, their families, for their school, and for their community. Dated this day. Congratulations. I'd just like to say thank you to everyone. Okay. Thanks, and we'll have the girls here. Here you go. You're a Thank you. All right, well, let me add one thing. Yeah, thank you. I want to add one comment. Uh, winning a state championship and winning in any sport takes not just good luck and ability. It takes a lot of hard work over a number of years. And I congratulate you for putting in that time and that effort. And I would also pass on that it is that time and effort applied to other things in your future that will gain you the same kind of success. Nice job. Okay, I think that's the only other group here for the presentation. Uh, we will then move to citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Yes. Step forward, Jane, and say who you are and okay. please what you'd like to discuss. Thank you. My name is Jane Sneerson, and I'm here as co-chair of the Broad Cove Association. And my topic is the road race that's coming up. A little misinformation goes a long way, and as co-chair of the association, some of the backlash came to me with people saying, what do you mean we're not going to be able to get out of Broad Cove Road for six hours? Uh, <laughs> thanks to, to what I just read. That's not the case. Uh, there is some concern, however, that the road, that our access will be denied even if it's for an hour or an hour and a half or two hours, depending on how fast the, the race really gets started and how, how quickly the mass of runners gets through. I understand this is going to be an annual event, and I think our hope in the association is that some more consideration be given to the distress that it's apt to cause people who, for instance, have to be in South Portland at 9 o'clock and in the interest of, of being on time will have to leave home by 7.30 in order to get to South Portland for sure by 9 o'clock, uh, either to go to work or to go to class or to whatever. 
uh, this can cause some distress. And for tradespeople who want to get in and out it, you know, to our particular area, as well as others that are affected by the road closings, it's apt to be a real consideration and perhaps a hardship. So uh, I know it's too late for this year, but if indeed it's brought before the council next year, I would hope that uh, perhaps other arrangements could be made. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. Uh, I thought that whereas the information apparently that has been circulating around is not always entirely correct, that either Mike or uh, the police chief, uh, David Pickering, might like to take just a moment to address exactly what will be happening and over what time frame and how that affects the people in not only Broad Cove. Well, why don't I start, and then if, if I misspeak, the chief can, uh, can fill in. Uh, the, the roadway was originally approved uh, I think much earlier this year or late last year by the town council. The approval, though, when it came to the town council was actually for the use of the park, Fort Williams Park. Road races by ordinance are actually approved by the chief of police. Uh, this particular road race, is, as uh, Ms. Snearson has indicated, is, is a very major road race for the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, we do have almost 3,000 runners who will be coming to Cape Elizabeth. August 1. Uh, many of them are staying in local homes, being hosted by people in the community. Uh, the, the races themselves are uh, world-class runners, uh, folks that run in 10K, uh, the tops in the nation. Uh, and that's all fine and, and very enjoyable, but it, it does have a, a trade-off. And that's with the race beginning at uh, just on the other side of Crescent Beach State Park by Monastery Road, and continuing to Fort Williams Park uh, in 3,000 runners, it's, it will be necessary to close off roads at certain times. Chief Pickering has worked very, very closely with the race organizers, uh, with a gentleman by the name of particularly David McGilvray, who's the technical director for the Boston Marathon and is the race director here in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, he has developed, working with them, a road closure plan uh, that provides essentially the following road closing times. Again, this is on Saturday, August 1st. Uh, Route 77 from Sprague Hall to Crescent Beach State Park, will be, which is where the race begins, will be also its organizational efforts, will be closed from 6 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. Route 77 from Crescent Beach State Park to the Church of the Nazarene, which is really where the southerly end of Old Ocean House Road is, uh, that it does include Broad Cove, two lights uh, in that area will be closed from 7.30 to 8.30. Uh, Old Ocean House Road will be closed from 7.30 a.m. to 8.45 a.m. Route 77 from the intersection just beyond the center of town to Shore Road uh, by the Key Bank will be closed from also from 7.30 to 8.45. And Shore Road from Key Bank, Cumberland Farms, down to the old main gate at Fort Williams will be closed from 7.45 a.m. to 9.30. Again, the road race begins at 8 a.m. And this, this closing schedule takes account of the mass of runners uh, coming through the community. It is possible that some roads will be reopened earlier. However, anyone in planning their schedules uh, should not plan on that. Uh, People's Heritage Bank, the primary sponsor of the race, along with uh, Joan Benoit Samuelson, the race founder, uh, will be sending out a mailing to every household in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, the mailing is due to go out on Wednesday that will have this road closure information and also other uh, information about the race. If anyone didn't get those road closures, they are available on the Cape Elizabeth Town webpage at www.capeelizabeth.com. Uh, it also will be in the letter. There will be some posters that will be going up in the community this week. And, uh, you know, it, this, this is a major undertaking. Uh, we have been concerned a little bit with some of the lateness of the news getting out, but uh, the race organizers <coughs> really understand the concerns, particularly when they hear comments like Ms. Nearson's that there are some rumors about that the roads are going to be closed uh, much longer than, than planned. Uh, I would like to thank the police department and the chief for the cooperation in working uh, with the race folks to be sure that the public safety is watched for. And one final comment is that uh, if anyone's concerned about emergency public safety getting to their neighborhoods, the fire department and the police department has been working very closely with the race organizers. 
and, and in fact there will be closer medical attention, rescues, fire department to most properties than there usually is uh, because they will be strategically positioned in areas uh, to enable the, the fastest possible access plus the fact that we will have up to 3,000 runners uh, to be absolutely sure that the medical needs of the, the uh, folks in the race are looked after as well because if it's eventually reaches 90 degrees in Cape Elizabeth, which doesn't look too likely this year, uh, you could, even at that time in the morning, you could have issues with uh, dehydration and other effects of heat. So any questions on the road rates? Just one, one final thing. Uh, th they do hope for it to be the first annual, but they will need to come back uh, to the town council uh, for approval and we'll be having meetings immediately after the race, uh, not on that day, but the following week to uh, go over all the different issues that have come up and to see that see if the problems are, are significant enough that perhaps the race might not be able to uh, occur on the same route in a succeeding year. Council, questions? Mike, mention if you would just for the people that may want to come and see the race, when they want to leave, where they might park, and where they could see the, ga uh, the game, the race. Yes, the, 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 best, the best advice is for all those folks who live along the route simply to walk to their end of the street or walk to the end of their driveway and cheer the runners on. They'd very much appreciate that. Uh, anyone could come up Route 77, see the race here in the center of town. They, they could go to the finish. However, if they're to go to the finish, they will need to go out the Fowler Road route and not out Route 77 because they'll be setting up for the race further out 77. Uh, if, they, if they want to go to Fort Williams, it's advised that they, they get there early at about 7 a.m. Parking will be somewhat limited at the fort. However, at that time of the morning, we, we feel that uh, it should work fairly well. One of the, the, the good thing about the race is that it'll be all over really about 9.30 in the morning so that most activities will be over. When they, they discussed scheduling of the race, we looked at Sundays. We didn't want to interfere with church schedules. We looked at later in the year, and we didn't want to interfere with youth soccer and some of those activities. And August seemed to be the best time, not only for the road race, but also for the least convenience uh, here in Cape Elizabeth. We also, uh, through community services, will be using the high school for road race registration beginning on Thursday. So at 8 o'clock in the morning. So a lot of folks will be coming into town uh, beginning June 30th to look at uh, to look at the route to, to actually pick up the registration materials and uh, otherwise uh, enjoy the beauty of Cape Elizabeth. Good, thank you, Mike. All set on that. Moving then to councillors' reports and correspondence. Councillors' reports. Uh, Mr. Councilor Chairman, Chair. I'd just like to mention that uh, there are three county commissioners for Cumberland County. And uh, our district includes uh, about a half a dozen towns, including Scarborough, uh, South Portland, and uh, Cape Elizabeth, and Standish, and Westbrook, and I think Baldwin. Uh, th that's our section of the county, which is represented by one commissioner. And one of the uh, budget advisory committee members from our district uh, has completed her term. And tomorrow night at uh, the South Portland City Council Chambers at 7 o'clock. There will be a caucus to select another one. So any uh, uh, municipal officers who are the only ones who have a vote here who would like to take part, uh, I urge them to be there. I shall be there myself. And uh, only one member of the Budget Advisory Committee may serve from each community. So uh, I'm from Cape Elizabeth for another year. And uh, then uh, there's uh, a caucus tomorrow night with Peter Feeney, who is our uh, <coughs> county commissioner from this district. Good, thank you. So all that can be uh, make it, uh, we'd like to have the support. Other reports? Councilor Groff. Uh, yes, I got a call from Neil Allen, who is a very capable fellow who uh, used to be the executive director of MWAC, which is a trashed energy plant up in Auburn, Lewiston, but he's a Portland, Portland guy. He has been appointed as the executive director of uh, COG. Um, I've known Neil for a long time, and I have every confidence that if anybody can get COG moving again, it's Neil Allen. So I'm very pleased to report that, and uh, uh, I look forward to meeting with Neil and uh, uh, for lunch, and hopefully uh, he will succeed. Good. Thank you. Other reports? 
Seeing none, we'll move on on the agenda. Uh, town manager's report, Mike. Yes, Chairman Byer asked me each month to, to give a report to the council. I'll try to keep these brief. Uh, a couple things. First, the town hall in the Tossmore Library will be closing on Wednesday at 12 noon, this coming Wednesday, uh, July 15th. The, uh, it's the day that the council has its annual employee appreciation event. And that's going to be held on Wednesday. We're having an excellent motivational speaker. And it, it should be something that uh, is very enjoyable. And we apologize for any inc inconvenience that may be for individual citizens. Uh, we also have unveiled, effective last Friday, the town's new web page. Uh, it, again, www.capelizabeth.com. Uh, for anyone who's home tonight that has internet access, if you want to look at the agenda, for instance, you can get the agenda by a, a click right off the front page, uh, home page of, of the web page. There's also uh, other interesting stories there. It's, it's, we now have the ability on a moment's notice to update it. Uh, so we'll be putting no school announcements on, for instance, within five minutes of, of when the superintendent makes the decision. Uh, things such as fireworks, when they're going to happen, when they're not. Uh, we'll have the ability to put those on within five or ten minutes. Uh, so we're, we're, we're really moving into the interactive uh, phase of it. And, you know, I see in, in the next year or so, uh, this is going to become a lot more intense in terms of a lot more two-way communication instead of one. All the town ordinances, with the exception of the zoning ordinance, uh, are finally on the web page and a lot of other good information. So I'd encourage folks to look at that. One of the uh, items that's on the web page at this particular time, but it's going to change almost daily, is the listing of the roads to be paved uh, this beginning tomorrow, in fact, weather permitting. Uh, some of you may have seen the paving machine on Trundy Road heading into Shore Acres. Uh, that is where it plans to begin tomorrow. <coughs> we'll also be paving Hannaford Cove Road, uh, Todd Road, Julian Lane, Meadow Way, Orchard Road in Elizabeth Park, Cherry Circle, Penwood Circle, Evergreen Circle, Pine Point Road and Brentwood Road in Brentwood, and Mitchell Road from Route 77 to the southern end of Stonegate Road. All of those should be done in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we'll also be doing undergoing reconstruction uh, in mid-August of Eastman Road that we've gotten a number of complaints about, as well as Sawyer Road from the Scarborough Line to the start of the area that was reconstructed in 1988, which is just at the top of the hill, uh, just above Silver Drive. So. Uh, if when we looked at the citizen survey, one of the areas that we seemed to get more concern over than some of the other areas was road maintenance, and that the paving was getting behind. And as uh, Chairman Byer mentioned, the courier, fortunately, the council did appropriate some more money, and citizens should begin to see uh, some results from that. Uh, finally, I just wanted to mention that at the end of the month, Jane Beckwith is retiring uh, from the Thomas More Library. She began work there in 1970. Uh, has just been uh, a real asset community. She served a long time as the children's librarian, uh, and then in later years as the reference librarian. When, when I look at the library and the folks that are there over the years, Norma Wadman and uh, Mary Stanwyck, uh, Marguerite Hollowell, uh, Jane is the real link over the years, and uh, the, her institutional knowledge, her uh, knowledge of the community, of, of its likes and dislikes with books and activities is just going to be uh, very difficult uh, to replace, uh, impossible to replace. And I know the council joins me well in wishing her a, a very happy retirement. So uh, she, she's a really good person. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Any questions for Mike? OK, uh, www.capeelizabeth.com, for those of you that didn't get it the first time. Okay, moving on to minutes of previous meetings of uh, June 8th. Anyone have a motion and or suggested changes? Move approval of the uh, minutes of uh, June 8th. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Second. Second. Second by Councillor Watson. Thank you. Any discussion? Any changes? Giving none, all those in favor? Any against? None. It passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, that brings us to the public sessions of tonight's meeting. We're going to have two public hearings. The first one is to discuss the proposed parking ban 
on a portion of Preble Street, proposed improvements, I'm sorry, then there, we'll go on to improvements of the pool after that, but we'll start out with the parking ban uh, piece. Uh, this is open to members of the public for discussion and presentation. Is there anyone here who would like to please come up? Please give us your name, state your opinions, and whatever you want to say. Thank you. Hi, my name is Steve Corey. I own 596 Preble Street. And we're talking about parking problems, at uh, particularly at Preble Street. Uh, basically, I, I don't know how many people are aware of the property there. Uh, has nine units. Uh, I don't know how many years it's been there, but 100 years as far as I'm concerned. But um, basically the parking has been on the street. Uh, during the winter, we've, uh, since we've had the problem with uh, Irving gasoline into the building and tanks and everything else, Irving has uh, worked with me to allow the people to park there during the winter so we can get them off the street so that the uh, town people can get plowed. And I think it's worked pretty well. Uh, now we're in a situation that uh, there uh, seems to be a situation of probably get fire apparatus and uh, emergency vehicles there. And uh, I'm concerned as well. Uh, but the problem is I have no other place to park these people. I have 19 vehicles in these, this particular house, uh, apartment house. Um, I've tried to buy property. Uh, I've looked uh, across the street. I've looked down the street. I've looked next door. Uh, it just there is no place this particular piece of property if I can get five vehicles in the yard I'm lucky um, I have some proposals that I'd, I'd like to um, talk about one is is trying a temporary basis of parking on the westerly side from the uh, corner of Shore Road to the corner of the Irving Station curb which is about 100 feet uh, and try that out uh, the problem I'm having is if if we this particular thing gets passed and these people get start getting towed and tagged uh, that property is you know, I have no other place to put them if I had other places I'd do it believe me but if they start towing and tagging them we've got I've got they're gonna move there's no two ways about it uh, I've done a lot of improvements to the building I've tried to bring it up in standards so it, it looks like a piece of property that belongs in Cape Elizabeth and not in downtown Portland uh, but I mean I I'm at I'm at a real R with this parking problem I mean I'll, I'll, I'll like to try something for us before we implement things because the fact of the end if I have these tenants towed and tagged uh, we've got a real problem I mean they won't stay obviously they're not going to stay if you keep telling and tagging them um, if somebody else has a piece of property they know I could buy that's close I'd be willing to look at it but I've uh, contacted a lot of people around here and there is no other land that I know of that I could purchase uh, and I'd love to get them off the street uh, the other proposal I was talk we talked about is possibly making the street one way, coming from, uh, it is a racetrack. There's no toys or what. I, many of times I've uh, almost got clipped myself getting in the car down through there. I mean, they're going through there about 40 miles an hour. Uh, if it could make it one way, uh, either going into South Portland or coming out of South Portland or something. I mean, I, I, I don't know what to tell you. I, don't, I really don't know what, to, what proposal is going to work. But my biggest fear is if you start towing and tagging and, and we start, we, these people start getting uh, tickets, I just won't have tenants. This is no way. I mean, if I could find a place to put them, I'd do it in a minute. And that's basically all I have to say. Mr. Chairman, could I ask uh, Mr. Corey? Yes. Uh, from the corner on the west side of yes. uh, Preble Street yes. to uh, 100 feet. Where is your 596? Uh, 596 is on the opposite side of uh, Irving Station. Uh, how many feet from the corner? More than 100? It's about, well, it's about, a, I would say about 100, 150, the most right in that whole that area. So you're suggesting this to make it about 100 feet yeah. from the corner? Down yeah. The I'd like to just try it as a temporary basis yeah. to see if it, I mean, I'm willing to work with it and I'm willing to send the tenants a I noticed to say, listen, you know, the, and I was even able to put my own signs up yeah. to try it. Uh, but uh, I didn't want to go pound no parking signs on Irving's property and say, here, you know, here I am. I'm going to put signs on your property. I was said, you know, I was afraid <coughs> to get upset. But I just don't know what else I can do. Uh, I'm, I, I wish that somebody had some more suggestions for me to, to, and if somebody knew a piece of property, I'd be more than willing to talk to that person. But I don't know what else to do. Other questions for Mr. Corey? Yes, Councilor Watson. Mr. Corey, 100 feet um, from the corner of Shore Road, would that put you just past the driveway across the street? I'm trying to just visualize where. What it will do is it will put me from the corner just to the curb, the cut curb going into the Irving Station. Okay, so it will not go past that drive. What if you extended it to 
beyond that driveway. Would, that would still would give you some parking. Well, that's what I'm saying. If I can only come down 100 feet to the cut curb that goes into Irving Station to the, to the gas station, on the opposite side, I can start parking from that side down, which would clear that whole intersection up so that they wouldn't go up in there. They wouldn't park from the, from the, the shore road side to the cut curb or the Irving Station. They wouldn't park that right in that whole area. They would park just. They would park on the opposite side, but not on that su side on the Irving side of the street. So just as you're making that corner, it would right. open that up. Right, right. It still does get somewhat congested, though, as you go down that street oh, and park. On, I, I on agree. Both I absolutely agree with you. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I wish I had some other answers for you, but that building's been in longer than I can know. I don't know. I don't know what the date was built, but I know it was an inn at one time. Um, secondly, Irving has put the curb there. Well, I don't know if that curb is on town property or it's on Irving property. I just don't know. I mean, all of a sudden, I went over there one day, and here's the curb, and here's the grass, and here's the lawn, and I don't know who's it belonged to, whether it belongs to them or it belongs to the town. I don't know. I do know, I wanted to just mention, I, I do know that you have tried to purchase property, because I've spoken to a couple of the abutters, and I do know that you've approached them about yeah. buying their property yeah, to resolve your problem. I'm, uh, believe me, if I could do it, if I could buy either one, either side, I'd be more than willing to do something. But I, I have no other, I have no place to put these people. I mean, and the biggest problem we have now is is that uh, I have I have totally changed the, the whole entity of people down there uh, by you know slowly upgrading the property so that I could. You know, start bringing a, uh, people that uh, have vehicles now, and most of them that were there when I first purchased it didn't have vehicles. Right. So this is where the thing is. This whole thing has changed because of the fact that being is uh, now they all have cars, whereas before I would say six out of the nine didn't have cars. Right. Other questions? Yes. Uh, yes, the gentleman. Um touched on one of my questions and that was do we know that the road as it lies is it in fact the surveyed uh, property do we know what's municipal what's serving and have you had a class a survey done of your property uh, when I first purchased it yes a class a I don't as know opposed I, don't, to a D? I, I don't I don't know that ma'am I don't know what but I, I just thought that um, it, when you're searching to buy perhaps you own and you might not know and I don't mean to sound like I'm trying to tell you what to do, but um, that would be a concern that I have is the road as it is right now with the definition of sidewalks and curbs and things that are there now. I would, uh, before I ever voted to um, limit the parking in this manner, I would want to know that that was truly the way the road um, should be because if someone has encroached upon the public way uh, by sidewalks or the improvements that was done at the Irving station in recent years, then I would think that that would be a hardship on the uh, landlord to do that. And then the other question, um, have we considered, and this, I'm sorry to speak past you, but have we considered the idea of a one-way road? Because that is in fact a dangerous intersection. I drove up a few times myself to try to get a feel for what was going on there. and. Uh, the sight distances as you come out Preble Street uh, could be problematic for certain drivers, and I, I'd like the idea of the one way. So. May I suggest that this is the public hearing piece, yes. so we'll limit ourselves to the questioning the people who may want to present, and then we'll have our discussion when we vote in a minute. No. And I, I thought you were easing toward the discussion, so I mentioned that. Thank you, pardon. That's okay. Yes, Councilor McGinney. I had a couple of questions to the chair, if I could. Um, you said that um, for the winter time. Uh, you've made some arrangement with the Irving station. Yes. Why is that not possible during the summer? Well, the problem is that he has more cars that he uh, he actually brings in during the summertime, and um, he uh, originally I had a real problem. I don't know who I talked to on the council one time. I talked to somebody. Uh, I had a real problem because of uh, uh, the you know the and I can understand the town's position. They got to get a plow through there. I mean, there's no two ways about it. Uh, and I said, well, geez, I mean, they can't keep the street clean if they can't get the cars out of the way. So I did go over and talk to them. I did go many years ago when I bought the property. And I was just about told, you know, well, don't worry about it, blah, blah, blah. And that was it. And, and, but the gentleman, I went back again and said, listen, I'm in a real dire need. For, and and, and they, they did let me do it. So uh, that did work out. But in the summertime, he just has so many car repairs that I, he has no place there from. He has none. A second question, if I may. The uh, 
lot or property that's just north of the engine one fire station it's pretty good sized I, I lot. talked to that lady okay and that's a no-go no I I, I I I the same thing um, talked to the particularly that owns it uh, for winter parking as well and I said but geez you know all they do is walk down to the back and they'd be right in the right in the building and I was even willing to light the you know, because I mean, I'm an electrical contractor, I was willing to light the property to, so that they could walk through safely at night. And uh, she says she has a real problem with parking, uh, getting enough people parked in there herself. So, thank you. Other questions? Councilor Fritz? I just want to be clear about where you're suggesting that 100 feet. Uh, Bas basically, there, there if two, you if there, you if there are you, two driveway cuts there. And are you suggesting the entire length? No, of the no. The be, it be, if the you were coming, if you were coming. Uh, I think this is northerly towards Cape Elizabeth. It'd be the second driveway cut towards Ch to Shore Road. So the, it leaves the intersection open. Uh, it even makes it difficult for one of my neighbors to get out of there. And I, um, and I can, I feel bad from that particular. That's why I said maybe we'll try that section from, from the second curb cut to the corner of Shore Road and uh, and see how that would work out from and we just post some signs and see how it works mm -hmm. um, I'd like to just try this on a, on, a, on a basis you know just to see how, it, how it's working mm -hmm. and then uh, either come back to the council or come back to the police uh, chief and say hey you know it's it is working it isn't working let's make it permanent and if they do park in then we take them that's you know they, they'll have to learn so uh, I mean, I'm open for suggestions from anybody believe me and then I just want to know how many um, spaces you actually have on your own property. Five. Five spaces Five. and you have nine apartments. Right. So and you don't have one for every... No. That or building, for that one. Was, that building was that way when... I, matter of fact, when I, before I did buy it, I asked. And I said, where do these people all park? Because I mean, I'm looking at a nine-unit building and I'm saying, where do they park? And they said, well, they park on the street. And I said, well, is there a problem with the town? And, and they said, no, usually not. But you got to understand, at that time, uh, I didn't have nine units and 19 cars. I mean, I, didn't, I had nine units, but I didn't have 19 cars. It's just the turnover of people, and now the people are commuting from Portland to Cape. Uh, are a lot, I have a lot more now than I did previously. The questions for Mr. Corey? Mr. Corey, anything else that you wanted to present? No, I'm, I'm, that's it. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Are there other members of the public who would like to present, talk about this subject? Uh, hearing none, I guess it's time to close the public hearing on that subject, and we will come back and be voting on that in a few minutes. In the meantime, we will move to discuss on public hearing the proposed improvements to the Donald Richards Pool at the Cape Elizabeth High School. Are the members of the public who'd like to speak to that? Mr. Sear. Please say who you are as well for the members of here who don't know you. Thank you. My name is Dave Sear. I live at 15 Macaulay Road. Um, the, uh, I'm the, uh, the chairman of the pool committee. Uh, the, uh, the committee was commissioned last year to develop a proposal for renovating and improving the Donald uh, Richards pool and for developing recommendations for uh, making improvements to the pool wing, which is on the um, uh, adjacent to the, uh, the pool facility. The community, as I understand it, has been studying the uh, Donald Richards pool for a number of years, something in the order of two and a half years, to look at possible changes to the pool and, and res renovations that are needed at that facility. Uh, an earlier committee worked with the town's consultant, Harriman Associates, to investigate the condition of the pool. And uh, they issued the, their findings in a report dated December 30th, 1996. That report provided very specific details about the extensive repairs needed to upgrade the pool to current standards. Their report was also used as a basis for the current committee's work, which culminated in, drafting, in the drafting of a second pool report this one was dated April 1998 and addressed and outlined the current committee's findings and recommendations. Our report was presented to the town council in, the, in an April meeting and copies have been made available to the town, uh, in the town office for review by the general public. The committee developed its recommendation 
by working with Harriman Associates and by seeking input from the community and from a pool expert which attended uh, some of our uh, committee meetings. The Cape Courier published several reports informing the community about the progress of the committee's work and in the July uh, 4th edition provided details about the proposed scope and projected cost of the committee's recommendation and uh, encouraged uh, community participation in this meeting. The pool was constructed, the existing pool was constructed in late, late 1960s, I believe 1967, and quite frankly has reached its useful life. Significant repairs are needed to the pool basin and pool systems. Uh, I'm not going to review all of those uh, repairs and uh, mechanics that, that, that need to be changed because all of that is uh, actually covered in the report. However, I'd like to note that temporary repairs to the pool were made in 1997 to ensure the integrity of the pool deck for the short term, while the town found comprehensive, a comprehensive long-term solution for addressing the pool problems. Reinforcement steel in the concrete in some areas of the pool decks and basin have been weakened by chlorine sat saturation to a point that the experts tell us the pool will only last two to five years. And the focus of our committee has been to look at this in terms of a, a two-year uh, use, remaining useful life uh, of the pool and developing a strategy to try to get a new pool in place uh, by that time. For the reason that this is basically a, a, a pool with a very, very uh, limited useful life remaining, the committee believes that uh, there's some sense of urgency in addressing the pool problems in a timely manner and has recommended in past discussions with the council and with the general public that the council take prompt action to approve the process for designing and constructing the pool renovations recommended by the committee uh, as soon as possible. Since we've already reviewed the, the proposal with the town council on two previous occasions, uh, once in, in April and the second time we had a meeting, I believe, in the first of June in a workshop session, the, um, uh, we're not going to, uh, to review the, uh, the report this evening, however, I guess we had planned on having representatives from Harriman Associates here this evening, and I understand that they're not here. Mike is shaking his head. But we do have members of the, the pool committee in attendance uh, that would be prepared to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, I'll close by saying that the committee unanimously supports the recommendation outlined in the report, and, and that is option, option D in the report. And we encourage the council to vote in favor of the resolution that has been uh, handed out this evening and I believe is... Uh, in front of you for consideration tonight. Uh, that's all I have. If there are any questions, I'd be ha happy to address them. Questions by the council? For Mr. Sear? Questions? No? All right. Dave, thank you very much. Other members of the public who would like to speak to the uh, pool renovation? Okay, I'm assuming since I see many people who are on that committee, that you're comfortable with David's presentation and do not need to reiterate it. Uh, last chance, anyone else want to speak? Yes. Is that Tom? Uh, good evening, uh, members of the council. Uh, my name is Tom Emery. I live at 12 Juniper Lane in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I have to admit, uh, complete and thorough ignorance on the, uh, the study. I haven't had a chance to review the study, nor on the re recommendations, the costs or the impact on the, on the tax base, but I'm assuming all that information was part of the report and is uh, uh, Council's privy to all of that. I'm coming from a uh, point of view of a family that has had uh, years of experience in competitive swimming. Uh, Thirty years ago, I was a senior in high school and swam for Bangor High School. Uh, in terms of a recreational activity uh, for lifelong exercise and well-being, uh, I don't think there's anything much better than, than uh, swimming. Uh, I'm a living testament to what happens when you stop swimming for five <laughs> years uh, and have full intention of, of returning to the pool. But aside from the physical plan itself, uh, in a personal note, I'd just like to relay the fact that my brother is the coach of the Bangor High School team and, and used to hold swim clinics with Don Richards in Cape Elizabeth and knows many of the uh, town citizens. 
Uh, I was reviewing an editorial from a swimmer of his who swam for Bangor High School in 1975 when they won the state championships. That swimmer is now the assistant swim coach for Auburn University and ran into my brother at the NCAA tournament and uh, meet and send an editorial to the Bangor Daily News talking about his growth and experience uh, having been a competitive swimmer in high school. Uh, my brother celebrated his 25th anniversary about three years ago of coaching and has received hundreds of letters like that over the years. Uh, I'm sure this type of uh, issue is not necessarily as, as important to the report as the issue of, of the costs and, and the impact on the tax base, but there's competitive swimming is much like cross countries and, and other uh, cross country track and other sports that uh, there aren't large crowd. It requires a tremendous amount of dedication self-discipline and at the end of the season one sticks one's head up out of the water to see where one's finished in the state meet and recognizes one hopes early enough in one's career that if one is going to do better if one missed by a tenth of a second one only has oneself to blame for that so it really is a lifelong lesson in self-discipline and perseverance and delayed gratification and i think of, of many of the attributes this town has i think a, a pool for recreation competitive swimming and general uh, recreation is something that the town council should support. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak tonight on the subject of the pool? Yes, please come up. My name is Sally Karras. I live at 7 Stonebridge Road. I am uh, the president of Coastal Maine Aquatics, which is the United States swimming uh, Cape Elizabeth's United States Swimming or USS Swimming based competitive swim program. We have approximately 150 swimmers in our program ranging in age from 5 to 18 and actually right now we have some returning college swimmers swimming for the summer with us as well as a few adults who swim periodically throughout the year so 5 to 18 is sort of the, the age range that we concentrate on but we have extremes on either end as well. Um, Coastal Maine Aquatics has worked very hard to create a competitive swim program for our community at all levels of swimming, from novice swimmers right up through nationally ranked swimmers. We have, we believe, an excellent coaching staff. We have a board composed of uh, volunteer parents who are extremely hardworking. Obviously, the Cape Elizabeth Pool is a an integral component of our, our program. Although I was not a member of the pool committee, I did attend most of the meetings. Um, as a resident of C Cape Elizabeth and also as the president of Coastal Maine Aquatics, I'd like to thank the pool committee for the work that they've done so far. I believe that their proposal is both fiscally prudent as well as a, pro a, pol a proposal that will meet the basic needs of the community. My only regret, and I say this sort of half-jokingly, is that there was no way that we could squeeze a 50-meter pool into the existing facility. Um, I say that because Maine is one of the very few states in the country that does not have a 50-meter swim swimming pool, and this represents a significant disadvantage for competitive swimmers when they try to compete on a national level. I clearly recognize that this is not Cape Elizabeth's problem alone, but I would urge this community as well as the entire state to address that issue in the future with an open mind because I think it's a facility that this state badly needs. To close, again, I'd like to voice my support for the pool committee's proposal, and I look forward as a member of uh, Coastal Maine Aquatics and as a member of this community to working with them on the future stages of this uh, project. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Are there members of the community who would like to speak to the pool? Yes. Step right up. Please give your name. Hopefully, uh, TV's in color. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Varney Hitley in uh, 8 Park Circle. And I have just a very simple question, and that is, could you please take the members of the pool committee, who apparently weren't, most of whom weren't here at the uh, last committee meeting through the mechanics of the legal opinion and why that is necessary and uh, why we need a citizen referendum on this. Could you just uh, educate us, please? Thank you. Yes, hopefully you can do it, Mike. Would like you to do it now? <laughs> sure, go ahead. Yeah, the, um, under the state school construction law, uh, there's a provision, there's many different provisions requiring different projects to, to be subject to citizen referendum. Uh, we thought that the pool might be exempt since it's not going to be at all part of the school budget. 
It's proposed to be totally funded out of the school budget, that it's recognized to be a community pool and not a school pool. Uh, we, we did, however, ask Drummond, Woodson, Plimpton, and McMahon, that's still the name, these law firms keep changing their names, uh, to look at whether or not, despite all of that, the school construction law still would apply. They indicated that it would because any addition to a school building, whether it be for community use or any other use, that is at least 600 square feet in total space does require a citizen vote on the, on the proposed improvement and on the project. Uh, I confirmed with Harriman Associates that this is, in fact, uh, well in excess of 600 square foot addition with the entryway that is going in. So therefore, it, it does uh, throw it into the position that it is subject to a citizen vote. Uh, that's how it came about. The proposal is to, uh, is to have that vote, uh, if the council so desired, uh, on November 3rd. And you know, I can go in at the appropriate time some more of the that's proposal. Fine. Barney, that help? Yep, thank you. Other members of the public would like to speak? Yes, sir, please come up, give your name, and go ahead. I am Merle Backus, though, Smuggler's Cove Road, a senior citizen, obviously, and I'd like to support endorsement of the pool committee suggestion or that the new pool be built with dispatch. My information comes from various sources. Uh, I spoke with a member of the a pool committee, planning committee, uh, the original committee back many years ago. And as was pointed out, uh, the pool was built not only for the students, but for the community. I think at that time, senior citizens were not uh, being considered as uh, an important part of a, a program. I assure you that there are a number of senior citizens who are using the pool and are using it enthusiastically. I would add one morning when swimming, of uh, talking to some of the repairmen, doing some work, necessary work, to maintain the pool, a unsolicited uh, remark from one of the uh, workmen, no consultant, no uh, official standing, was saying, gosh, this is money going down the drain. Uh, and uh, we, it won't be long before these cast iron pipes are going to be um, useless again. And these repairs will, will not uh, stand up uh, uh, as they w we would hope they would do this. And it seems to me, as an observer, I was not aware of a referendum and well, just a short while ago, uh, a referendum is going to end up costing the community more money. And uh, I guess there is no way out of this. If you have a, a legal opinion that we have to do this, but if there's any way to short circuit and speed up the process, I would strongly urge that the council take such steps to, to implement such, such a decision. I would support, strongly support, any effort to do what is necessary to get a new pool. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Hackett. Other members of the public? Yes, Mr. Dexter. I probably should say uh, I ditto everything Dr. Baxter just said. Just give I, your name and your address if you would. Oh, okay, I'm John Dexter. Yep. I'm, uh, excuse me. I'm one of Jan Brown's water babies, senior grade, that is. <laughs> but uh, um, I, I just want to tell you that I think 
a pool in Cape Elizabeth is, is, is something that we've got to have. It's uh, <clears throat> um, or, or something we should have. It means so much to so many, and it's, uh, well, um, the pool committee has said that uh, the present pool is, needs so much that it probably wouldn't pay to fix it. Um, and it would be better to put a new one in. Um, 2,000 or 2 million point two is an awful lot of money, but what do we get for it? We get a, a year-round facility, and we get a facility that everybody can use from little kids to old seniors. And uh, it's used for so many of us, for so many things. Some, it's used for exercise. In some cases, of course, it's used for therapy. Uh, in my own case, I used to run, but in 92, I had to have a couple of new knees put in, and the doctor said no more running. So swimming was the answer. And uh, I swim every day that pools open. That is when I'm able. And um, I do think that uh, it means, as I say, so much to so many people. Um, you all probably remember in the Cape Courier several months ago, there was a, an article and then some were letters that answered to it in which uh, some of the people in Cape Elizabeth were willing to pay $10 million for an outdoor pool and uh, a skating rink. Of course, it was April Fool's, but if they were willing to pay that much, heck, we can get a pool here maybe for two million two, saving us about seven million eight hundred. I think we ought to jump at it. <laughs> so, anyway, folks, uh, I'm, I know that it's probably going to go to referendum, and it's not going to be settled either. But I do think that it's something we should all try to promote. And uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Dexter. Yes, Jim. My name is Jim McFarland, and I live at 4 Belfield Road in Cape Elizabeth. And uh, the only group that we haven't heard from is, I guess, the Masters, um, which I started swimming about four or five years ago, and it's a new sport for me. Um, <clears throat> and I get up at uh, about 5 o'clock, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and go sit in the parking lot and wait for the pool to open so I can swim from 6 to 7. Um, for me, it's, it's probably the best new exercise that I've ever known. Um, I also have two children who swim with Coastal Maine Aquatics. <clears throat> and as far as uh, uh, an exercise and a, an all-around um, character builder for my kids, it's been terrific. Um, I think they've learned uh, how to be better students. Um, how to be uh, friends with other people, how to swim competitively. And, you know, it's a whole new world for me because I never knew anything about swimming and when I grew up. Uh, so starting at the age of 37, I, I think it's the best thing that, that's happened to me in my life. So certainly I hope the town uh, does support the uh, uh, proposal in front of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other members of the public? Yes, sir. Uh, Please come up. <coughs> Good evening. I'm Bill Tinsley. I'm from uh, Two Lights. I want you to know that I'm, I'm a, uh, I was born in Cape Elizabeth, and I've been a resident for about the last 20 years. And of that time, 20-year uh, time, I swam at the pool about four days a week. Um, I can't tell you how important it is for the senior citizens to have this pool. But as, as, as you already have heard, uh, it's pretty important. I, and for them, I'll say I adore, uh, endorse it. But for the last couple of three weeks, I, when I, I usually go at 6 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and the the pool is crowded at those hours. Uh, but for the last couple of weeks, it has been open to children taking swimming lessons. And there are kids coming in there like that that they can't c 
hardly hold, hold their, their swing trunks up, and kids about that age, every, everybody is learning to swim. And I think you, uh, you pe people as a body can't deny people that opportunity to, to learn to swim. It could be their, their, their whole, it could be their life's, it could, it could be their whole, uh, help me, <laughs> it could be their life, it save their life. And so I certainly would tell you, not from a, from a, from a senior citizen's point of view, but from the kid's point of view, and all ages, to endorse this, uh, uh, say yes to this proposal. I thank you. Okay. Thank you. Other members of the public? Okay. Uh, seeing none, I will move to uh, close this part of the public hearing. Uh, but before I do, I would like to have the people who are on the committee here just stand and if you would just give your name and we will thank you because I know that you put in a lot of time and energy. Hmm. Dave, you're sitting with a whole row of folks and I see some others who came so you were on the group. Who else? Yeah, stand up and let everyone see these are the people that did the work. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh yes, all right, thank you. <laughs> Good. And thank you all very much. All right, that closes the two public hearings. Now uh, the council has to go to work. Item number 21, consideration of the proposed amendment to the traffic schedule to ban parking on a portion of Preble Street. What is the pleasure of the council? Mr. Chairman. Councilor Barry. Uh, first, there's a point I would like to uh, raise in the wording of the the uh, section that's quoted in our notes here. Uh, it says, no person shall stand or park a vehicle in any of the following places and so on. I think it would be appropriate to say, no person shall allow a vehicle to stand or park a vehicle. And uh, I mean, we're talking about cars. We're not talking about people standing on the street. And I would feel more comfortable if that were made clear, I think, in the ordinance. Uh, as far as the uh, uh, point of uh, the 100 feet that Mr. Corey has suggested, is it possible to do a trial or do we have to uh, contact the state in, in order to amend an ordinance uh, as we did on speed limit signs uh, or can we do a, a trial? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Mike? Right. It, it's we, difficult to do a trial. You either amend the ordinance or you don't. Which you, you, if you were so inclined, you could amend the ordinance and you could veto it you know, at some point in the future. <coughs> The, the 100 feet from the, from the staff point is, is a reasonably good compromise if that's the direction the council wants to go. Mm -hmm. As Mr. Corey indicated, it does take care of the worst part of the situation, it which does. is the intersection itself. While ideally we would like to see the full 250 feet because it is congested in that area, we do realize that it does put a, a uh, tremendous burden on the uh, residents of this particular property and, and adjacent properties. Well, then, uh, since it, it must be an amendment to the ordinance, or then I'll make a motion uh, that, number one, the, the language of the uh, Article 2 parking regulations, Section 13-2-2 be amended to include the words, allow a vehicle to, after the word stand, and to, uh, uh, in section uh, Q14 to read on the westerly side of Preble Street beginning at the intersection of Shore Road and extending 100 feet in a northerly direction. Is there a second to that motion? Yeah. Did, uh, did, did I say uh, after? after? I'm sorry, I, I misspoke here. The, the, the allow a vehicle to comes before the word stand and after the word shall. Thank you, Councilor Barry. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second that motion. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Watson. Let us take up discussion then on that uh, motion. Councilor Reed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was just wondering if uh, we've exhausted all the possibilities. To me, this is kind of a white and black issue, and this is the black. 
and there must be some gray in there somewhere. Um, the town of Cape Elizabeth does not ordinarily um, put up signs that say residents only or uh, yeah. residents only during certain periods of time, but I was wondering if we could have a discussion about allowing that. This is a, uh, a commercial venture. The property taxes are paid based on the rental income that comes out of that, that it's not a residential property. I think that um, there might be some other concessions that we could make. Um, also, I'd like to have a discussion about making that road one way, uh, going either way, but uh, going towards Willard Square, of course, would, as I stated earlier, would be my personal preference. Also, um, I would like to know if the, the town has had that road survey to make sure what is truly the public way and what has just been used over the years and has uh, become known as the public way. Let's take those one at a time going backwards. Uh, survey, Mike, you know? Yes. Uh, at the time the Irving Station uh, put in the curbing, uh, if anyone saw the prior condition, it was extremely unsightly. It was all overgrown. They had vehicles parked every which way, heading in every direction. Uh, it, it overall, it was an improvement to the property. Whether or not it was surveyed or not, you know, I don't think there's there's a single curb in the community that is not in the public right of way. Uh, you know, they're all you know by their nature in the right of way. That's where they belong. So uh, you know, they did put the curb in the natural course of events uh, as as one goes down goes down the road. As, as far as looking at the grades, at the staff level, we've been discussing this problem for three years. Uh, I had never brought it to the council prior to now because we kept searching for the gray. We kept searching for another way to do it, realizing it would, it would have an impact on this property. The, the difficulty is the problem, you know, there, there were simply no grays. Whether it's a resident vehicle, a non-resident vehicle, it's still a vehicle. And when you ban the 100 feet, as Councilor Berry's motion has suggested, that takes away two parking spaces. Uh, both of those, from a technical point of view, are probably already in violation of our current ordinance because you can't be parked within so many feet of a driveway and you can't be parked in so many feet of an intersection. Maybe you could squeeze one vehicle in between those two areas. Uh, you know, we, we generally don't enforce those because people show good sense and don't park that close. Uh, although, you know, we, we do give warning notices at some point. So, you know, this 100 feet is really, really minimal in terms of the, the amount of space that, you know, it only takes away two parking spaces, but it is the two that, that are closest to the road. And the one-way suggestion, our experience looking at one-way streets, I know when, if you look at them in Portland, uh, in South Portland, they tend to increase the speed of traffic. Uh, people see them as a sh shoot to go down. Mm. And particularly, uh, you know, I think State and High Street are the perfect example in the way the speeds have increased on those streets. There is already concern with vehicles going too quickly through this area. And if you had parking on both sides, you also had, you know, people shooting down there to go to SMTC, Willard Beach, and that whole area. Uh, you tend to create a more hazardous situation in terms of the pedestrians there. There is a sidewalk uh, on uh, Mr. Corey's side, uh, which is very helpful. And uh, you know, as far as his survey, his house, you know, if you've looked at it, is actually very close to the road. Uh, you know, there's, there's no way, you know, we'd like to keep a sidewalk there. There's no way you could have parking directly in front of his home in addition to uh, the sidewalk that's there. So uh, m my sense is what Councilor Berry has suggested uh, has already looked at all the grays and uh, is, a, is a reasonable compromise from ideally what the public safety chiefs and I feel uh, should occur if we weren't solely looking at public safety and not having to balance the, the public welfare of the folks who live there and the economic livelihood of the citizen who owns the property. Are there discussion, Councilor Berry? Mr. Chairman, would it be appropriate to uh, ask the police chief, uh, I don't want to put him on the spot, but uh, He's familiar with this program. Uh, if he has any thoughts uh, on, uh, on the motion that I've made just for discussion, I'd like to hear uh, if uh, he feels that that's appropriate uh, to attempt to, to resolve the problem that way.
appreciate your kind assistance. Well, in essence, I would agree with what the manager said. Uh, considering a one-way street, if that, if that was something that the council would consider, it should be one way from, I think it's Daw Road out to uh, Shore Road, rather than going from Shore uh, down um, Preble Street. Um, I don't really believe that uh, uh, having parking on the opposite side of the road is going to is going to do much good. We've tried to discourage that because there's a, a sidewalk on um, uh, the side that's, that's the problem where the apartment houses are. Going back 100 feet, as Mike mentioned, might be a good compromise. I don't think it's going to be quite enough. Uh, and again, it, something else I just forgot to mention. If we're talking about one way, that's really not going to, the, the problem has not been that we're meeting traffic there. The problem has been that there's just been too much congestion on either side of the street. And perhaps some uh, striping might help to alleviate or at least give people a benchmark to park inside of so that people didn't stand two or three feet away from the curb, which, which could be a problem. Well, that's not so difficult to do, right? That wouldn't be terribly difficult to do. And maybe that in conjunction with the 100-foot <coughs> consideration that Mr. Corey mentioned uh, may be a compromise. It would not be the ideal. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Other discussion? Chairman Byer, one, one concern I still have regarding uh, Preble Street is, is the speed issue. And um, as I mentioned at our last uh, discussion regarding this, the speed limit sign of 25 miles an hour is obstructed by a limb. That, it's been 30 days. The limb is still obstructing that, that speed limit sign. I think it would be helpful if we clip that so that it was clearly designated as 25 miles mile an hour. Speed is an issue in that area. And um, you know, I don't know what we can do about it except have someone there you know, passing out tickets to some people um, to get their attention. But it is an issue, and I think it's something we need, we need to do, address, as well as the issue of, of the parking and the uh, inability to get our, our emergency vehicles through there. You know, I would hope that the 100 feet would, would help to alleviate some of, of these issues. Um, it would be nice if we could go to the other side of that back, back parking lot. Um, you know, past that first one as you turn into Irving across from your building and, and up to that next one. That would help even more. I don't know how many feet that is. I don't know if it's a, a hundred or 150, but it, it would be nice if we had just that a little bit more buffer. But you know, I don't know what the solution is, but I think we, a compromise is in order somewhere here. Thank you. Uh, Mike, would you make note of the limb that might be blocking the uh, sign, please? Take care of it tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, no. uh, Councilor McGinney. I think we're on the right track with this. I'm, I'm not shy about coming back and revisiting this if this isn't helpful. I think we should try to um, implement a solution to this um, on an incremental basis. And I think this is, as I said, the right, right way to go. Um, I'm also concerned if we go too far, and we did receive at least one letter from the Palmquist in the neighborhood there regarding where this parking would go if it were not on Preble Street. And that's still a concern of mine. I mentioned that also previously at, the, at, the, at our previous discussion about this. Um, so again, I'm going to support this motion, and I hope that it will alleviate the problem. But if it doesn't, um, I hope that we're ready and willing and able to come back and address this again as soon as possible um, and see what further steps we need to take. Other comments? Councilor Fritz. Um, I, I don't think that the one-way solution is, is, is a solution because you still would have people parking on two sides and you still have to get the emergency vehicles through. Um, I don't really think 100 feet is quite enough. I think it really should go back to, uh, I, I think, at least past the second driveway, if not to the end of Irving's property. There's some um, brush that's hanging out into the road beyond the Irving property that I think keeps people from parking all the way up or close to the edge of the street. And that's a problem that I've seen as I go through there, because I go through there quite a bit. And um, cars seem to be just kind of parked all over the place in, in, you know, kind of sticking out into the street. And that seems to be a problem of having to wind your way through there. Um, so it seems that marking the spaces, marking a uh, center line, um, that kind of, and, and removing brush. Now, I don't know who is, can we remove the brush that's within the right of way, I would think. 
we can remove brush within a right of way, but I, I never indicate without having looked at it myself that we're going mm -hmm. to do that because mm -hmm. we, we've, we've done that a few times even after we've looked at it and there's, mm -hmm. there's been a, a bark worse than I mean, that's, that's, worse than one it's probably managed. worth <coughs> we'll look at three it. parking we'll look spaces at it. or something. It is uh, over, you know, overgrowing the pavement there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I think the issue is I, I think it's good to compromise. I am concerned about um, the the overflow traffic that would go into the other neighborhoods because I think it would. Um, but I'm very concerned about being able to get public safety vehicles through there. I think that's the most important consideration that we have here. So I think we need to, to make the space um, and like to compromise as much as, as we can. Good. Thank you. Other Council Councilor Groff. I think uh, uh, councilors have come up in, with a fine compromise. Um, I think uh, if it doesn't work, as Councilor McGinty said, we'll be back in six months. We'll do it again. I think uh, uh, Councilor Berry has hit on an idea that's really, if I'm listening, quasi-acceptable to everybody. <clears throat> the idea that nobody's happy and everybody's sort of OK is probably means it's a good solution. So I would move the question at this time. OK, we hear the motion to move the question. Uh, let us do that. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any against? None. Passes unanimously. Uh, thank you very much for all those of you who spoke. And thank you, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Corey, for coming to present. OK, we will now move to item 22, which is the recommendation considering uh, the Donald Richards pool uh, improvements. What's the pleasure of the council on that, please? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. I, Perry. I move that uh, the uh, proposed improvements as set forth in the literature that we have received to the Don Richards Pool at Cape Elizabeth High School uh, be adopted. Thank you. Is there a second to that? Maybe that's not a, a point of order. Yes. yes. Um, I'm not so sure that we can do that in the sense of with the legal opinion and with uh, our council saying that it must be sent out the referendum. I believe that the town manager has provided a uh, motion that has been reviewed by our council. Right. And I would not want us to be in violation of state law by uh, some of our other t town councils around the state have appeared to. Heavens, no, that's the last thing I would I do. didn't think you wanted to do that, Henry. So I would, uh, with the council permission, withdraw my motion and yield to Mr. Groff. Well, I'm <laughs> who was about to make another motion. Because mine no, wasn't seconded. I, I yes. understood right. that, that Mr. Berry's motion was to approve the draft, which for me, which only calls for the clerk and the attorney to come up with some ballot wording. Uh, it, it doesn't do anything untoward in terms of, in terms of the law. Uh, the only legal issue in this memorandum is in the second paragraph under the ordered section. The Cape Elizabeth Town Clerk is hereby directed to work with the town attorney. That is a violation of the town charter, the word directed, and that word should be as requested. Because you're not allowed to direct any subordinate of the town manager to do anything mm -hmm. by virtue of the, the charter. So that word should be requested. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Groff. I mean, I have the feeling that there's not much of a debate here in this council about this pool. Right. Uh, and I certainly uh, sense, but perhaps it would be better at this point in time uh, in this draft motion that we have if uh, the town manager would read the motion that he believes that uh, uh, our town attorneys have reviewed, and perhaps that would be acceptable to you, Mr. Barry, and then you could be the person who makes the motion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excellent suggestion. Mike? Yes. Uh, this was a, a draft order that was prepared following the town council workshop on the pool issue and following the legal opinion. Uh, proposed ordered that the Cables of the Town Council hereby grants concept approval for a renovation of the Donald Richard swimming pool at Cape Elizabeth High School. The project currently estimated at $2.2 million is to be planned with a new pool entrance area, spectator seating, a whirlpool spa, renovated locker rooms, repairs to the pool room, and a new pool basin. 
The Cape Elizabeth Town Clerk is hereby requested to work with the Town Attorney to create a ballot question on the proposed pool renovations to be voted upon by the citizens of Cape <coughs> Elizabeth on November 3, 1998. The draft form of the ballot and the warrant for the special municipal referendum is to be presented to the Town Council for consideration at the August 10, 1998 meeting of the Town Council. The Town Council is hereby, is also hereby reconstituting the Cape Elizabeth Pool Study Committee as the Cape Elizabeth Community Pool Building Committee. The former members of the Pool Study Committee shall be asked to serve on the Building Committee and are hereby appointed to the Committee. Joseph Kozlowski of 20 Park Circle is hereby appointed to replace Kerry Orcutt, who has indicated that she does not wish to serve on the Building Committee. In order to provide the citizenry as much information as possible, in order to vote on the pool, pool proposal, and to permit design to continue in a manner that ensures that the pool will remain safe until the renovations are completed, the Town Council hereby authorizes the Town Manager to sign a design services agreement with Harriman and Associates, provided that not more than $100,000 may be spent prior to the November 3, 1998 vote. The funds shall be allocated from the fiscal year 1999 budget appropriation for expenses related to the pool renovation and the implementation of improvements to the former Levitt property. And it's in parent that that appropriation was 225650 of which this is 100000 Thank you. Councilor Berry, was that your motion? Well, I think it was uh, Councilor Groff's motion, and I'll second it. How's that? Well, I didn't hear Councilor Groff make the motion. Oh, well, I'll be happy to make the motion. All right, it's moved. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councillor Fritz. Okay, further discussion. Councillor McGinney. Um, uh, two questions. On, regarding the timeline, um, and it's probably for Deb, um, as far as putting this on a ballot, is there a lead time we have to get that on? If the town attorney and myself working together, bringing it back to August, does allow that, it's really the absentee ballots that we have to be concerned about, that we have 30 to 45 days prior. I mean, there's, um, is there a constitutional? Uh, it's a state a, law under, under 21A for election law. How, how, how long prior to putting a referendum on the ballot do, do we need to have the language and all that? First of all, the council would have to approve the warrant. Okay. Okay. And August would allow us to prepare an actual ballot to have the ballots ready for the absentee ballots per the state law. Okay. So I'm comfortable with that. Okay. okay. Thanks. Second question is for Mike. Um, in the last paragraph on the first page, I'm not sure I understand, in order to provide citizenry with as much information as possible in order to vote on the pool proposal, proposal and to permit design to continue in a manner that ensures the pool remains safe, what does that mean exactly? The, I'll, I'll do the second half first. Uh, I think the, the comment that Dr. Backerstow made about some of the temporary pool repairs that we're doing, uh, those, I, I wouldn't go quite that they're throwing money down the, the drain because we, 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 you know, we had to do them. But it is obviously that the pool is, is deteriorating at a very fast rate. Once chlorine gets into the system, it, it, it goes at an even faster rate. I've had several discussions with Ernie McVean, the facilities manager, about the deteriorating condition of the pool. And that's what that is all about, so we go within the two to three years. The well, first this part, talks about design, though. I couldn't understand what design and safety the, the, because if we wait, if we don't start the design until December, that's more of a risk we are following with the safety okay. by delaying for another six months. Okay, that, that was my the yeah. point of my question. The information, I understand. And, and the first is I want to make clear is none of these hundred thousand dollars will be used for campaigning for the the pool. That, but what that is getting at is that if the process and the proposal is more evolved, citizens will understand better what they're voting on. Other discussion? Councilor Groff. First, I'd like to thank the pool committee. This uh, was one of the finest reports and efforts of any citizen group uh, in Cape Elizabeth. It was an excellent job. Uh, I am going to vote for this motion, but at the same time, I'm going to commend the pool group for being unbelievably honest in days, in these days when everybody says there's something hidden, uh, there's nothing for free. That's absolutely right. There is nothing for free, and this group faced that. This town should understand that with the debt service on this pool, our yearly expenditure on the pool will increase from 86000 uh, to about 218000 That's $132,000 extra that we will raise 
uh, in the tax base. There is nothing for free. Uh, you, everybody has this pool. There's nobody's fault that this pool has ended up now being in a position where its useful life is over. It was a state-of-the-art pool. We got every year out of its proposed useful life. A new pool will last 50 years, and rather than is 25 because of new technology. Uh, this is a good expenditure for this town, but it is an expenditure. And anyone who says that a new pool is free is wrong. Uh, anyone who says that we don't have to prioritize the pool with other expenditures in this town is wrong. I am for this pool. I will campaign vigorously for approval of this pool. If it did not have to go to public referendum, I would raise my hand tonight and vote for it. But everything has a cost, and don't think and don't believe that it doesn't. It's just a cost that's worthwhile. And that's, what, that's why we should vote for this pool. And I hope citizens, when uh, there is a referendum, vote for this pool. Thank you. Councilor, are there other comments, questions? Councilor Watson. Um, Chair Barry, I just wanted to, to kind of piggyback what, off what Joe just said. I have had some concerns about the $2.2 .2 million that it's going to cost to, to renovate the pool and also put in the additional uh, improvements that we want to do. But I've done some research into it, and, and as I, I do that, like Joe, I understand that you know nothing is for free, and it's going to cost us to fix this pool. And I am comfortable that the 2.2 .2 million is is a, a pretty reliable number. My hope is that when it's all said and done, that the 2.2 .2 million buys us the improvements that we all want, and the weight room, and all the other additional things that we have said we want regarding this pool. That's that's what my objective is, and I too support this. Um, and I wish it, it were a number that were less than 2.2 .2 million, but that seems to be the number that we keep coming back to. So I am in support of this. Good, thank you. Councilor Reed. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, as you served on this board, I sit on, on the predecessor board that uh, led into your um, committee that made this recommendation. And one of the things that I found in the community is the community as a whole does support this project. We found out recently with the responses to the questionnaires of the surveys that people do, in fact, support this. But we would be remiss if we didn't mention this evening at this particular time, in my opinion, that with this improvement will be an increased opportunity to generate non-tax revenues. Uh, services provided will have a fee attached, and the users will, in fact, participate in paying for this improvement. And I just think that that's a point that has to be made, uh, that even though people do pay to use the pool now, there will be more opportunities for them to pay <laughs> for more services and probably more money. Uh, so it's not just a straight uh, tax increase without some other economic uh, opportunities for revenue. Thank you, Councilor Weed. Other comments? Seeing none, we're prepared to move the motion and vote. All those in favor of Councilor Berry's uh, proposal, please raise your hand. I see uh, seven yeses. Are there any noes? There are not. It passes unanimously. Thank you. And those of you who are here about the pool, thank you very much for coming and presenting and your hard work. We'll now move to item. 23, consideration of proposal to establish committee to prepare draft language ordinance, uh, language in regard to town farm property. Okay. Would you like to give us an overview, Mike? Yes, on the town council held a workshop on June 15, 1998, at which you discussed with the uh, town farm technical committee uh, their recommendations as to an easement versus a uh, special zoning district. I, I drafted a proposed uh, establishment of a drafting committee assuming that you wanted this committee to both look at a draft conservation easement as well as to look at setting up a special zoning district. When one or more of the councils received this, uh, reviewed it over the last few days, <coughs> they indicated that I may not have understood the consensus of the, the council correctly and that you might have wanted just at this point a 
a draft zoning district and not the actual easement. You know, if, if that is the case, uh, this be before you this evening is a memo that simply highlights in italics and bold those couple of sentences that you would not want to have uh, as part of the proposal. So you can either move it as originally proposed, move it with amendments, or move it without that language that's in bold and italics. Would a member of the council care to succinctly uh, reiterate what we did at that last uh, public hearing uh, so that we can define that issue? Councilor Groff. Due deference to the town manager, I don't believe that either of his positions is exactly correct. I think there was a consensus at the workshop that there be a committee uh, to develop language for a special zoning district which should stand apart from any other issue. It was also the consensus of the town council that if that committee believed that it was appropriate for the council to also consider a draft conservation easement, that that was also within the purview of that committee to uh, propose such an easement, but it, the two were not to be tied together. One, the special zone should be able to stand apart, and then if there was a uh, believed need for an easement, that that could also be proposed and language could be worked out. And I think that was the absolute way we left the meeting. Now, if I'm wrong, I'm sure somebody will correct me. Councilor Reed? Although the discussion that evening was heated, it wasn't as hot as this room is right now, um, but I will say that I firmly believe that what the characterization that Councilor Groff just gave is clearly the way I understood the way I left that room, understanding the consensus to be. Councilor Fritz? I mean, I, I didn't know about the you know, the, the questioning of this, but I did go back and look at my notes, and it did have the, both the easement and, um, but you're, you're not saying that, that, it, it, you, that this committee wouldn't consider an easement also. No, I'm just suggesting that this particular language makes it appear that the town council, uh, it is not what we decided to do. I mean, I think what we decided to do at workshop, I've just tried to, mm -hmm. Uh, state as clearly and specifically as I could. And if you believe I misstated what was decided at the workshop, well, that's, that's yeah, fine. I, I don't have any problem with what you just said. I guess I'm not clear what the objection is. I mean, we're just getting this new draft tonight, so I'm not sure what the change is from one to the other. I, I think as I understand the discussion, I, I, I would first say that I agree with Councillor Groff and Councillor Weed as to what we agreed on. And I think the point that Councillor Groff is making is simply that the committee is charged with working on uh, zoning regulations. And they may, when they're not charged to come up with easement, but they may if they wish. And to some degree of specificity, I think, was what we said. And I think that's the only distinction that I understand you're making. That and with the idea that the special zoning district, which I think we <coughs> all express concern that there has to be some need to manage that property in the short run, let alone the long run, uh, has to stand separate and apart from any easement. That it was not the concept to have an, one integrated package present one could stand, the, the zoning district could stand without the easement. Mm -hmm. And the, the way this is phrased, the committee is required mm -hmm. to do both. And, and it certainly appears to me, reading the language of the way this was drafted, that these two concepts could be mixed. And, I'm not, and again, I'm not taking a position. I'm for one or the other uh, at this stage. I just want to be able, and I think the consensus of the workshop was that we should be able at the conclusion of this committee's work to at least enact a special zoning district because there was nobody against that. No one. All right? All right. And I would hate to see everything collapse because everything's tied together. But again, obviously this committee has the authority, just not the directive, to also uh, deal with the easement issue. 
May I suggest if the wording were changed in the second paragraph to where the sentence says there was a consensus to form a committee to develop language of a special zoning district and instead of saying develop, instead say and if they wish to develop a draft conservation easement. Would that do it? I, I'm sorry, Mike, do you have a yeah. suggestion? Yeah, what I came up with based on what I just heard, there was a discussion to form a committee to develop language for a special zoning district and that the committee could develop a separate and distinct draft conservation easement of the property recommended for, for uh, conservation easement portions of the property recommended for permanent protection. Does that sound all right to everyone? Why would you, I mean, I, I would oppose and they could. Why not just say and develop a separate and distinct? I, mean, I don't want that. that. I won't vote for that. That's why I wouldn't want it there. Then you don't need to. Uh, Council Groff. I think if I understood, we've had a couple workshops on this, and obviously I have sat in many, many meetings on this committee. And I am not suggesting that at some stage uh, there might be the necessity for an easement. What I've always been concerned about is that the easiest thing for this council to do is absolutely nothing and leave this land in an R2 district, R2 zone, where it could be developed and that this town council would not be making a statement to the future as to what should happen with this property. And all I'm trying to do is make sure that the council does something. And by the something, I mean make it, because we agree on a special zone. And the more we try to muddle it up and not have the special zone stand on its own, the more risk we run of doing nothing with this property. And that's why any language that makes it clear that there's a mandate for this committee to come up with a special zone and all the requirements of a special zone, they may then look at an easement, but the special zone must be able to stand alone whether there's an easement or not. And I thought that was the clear sense of that, our workshop. But may I just, as the chair, interrupt for a second? Uh, I'd like to suggest that we could avoid getting into a debate of the issues. We can do that if you wish. I'm not saying that we, we can or we shouldn't. But I am suggesting that we may wish not to. And I guess, Mike, if you'd like to reread your two sentences, then I would ask the council if, if everyone might be happy with this proposal. And if so, we'll move forward on that. And if not, we'll get into a discussion. Yeah, based on the discussion, you would need to make two changes. In, under the introduction, the final sentence would read, there was a consensus to form a committee to develop language uh, for a special zoning district, and that the committee could develop a separate and distinct draft conservation easement for portions of the property recommended for permanent protection. The final sentence <coughs> in the statement under draft committee responsibilities, the committee may also draft a separate and distinct easement that, if approved, would grant an independent authority the right to review and approve certain uses Fine. on the designated portions of the property. Would any councilor care to make a motion that that, as read, is uh, something that suits them? Councilor Berry, you're, you're proposing so move. Thank you. Second. Seconded by Councilor Fritz. Other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of that motion? This, this is the, the entire draft motion we're yes. voting on? Yes. As uh, approved by seven, are there any nay votes? We're not. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate you all being willing to move on on that. Which allows us to get to Tom, who's been waiting here for a long time, looking forward to speaking. This is an opportunity, item 24, receipt of report of the Telecommunications Committee Task Force, consideration of recommendation act, uh, recommended action to refer the report to the Planning Board for review and comment. Tom, please give your name and welcome. Thank you, Chairman Byer, uh, members of the Council. My name is Tom LaPrade, and uh, for about the last eight months, I've had the pleasure of chairing the Telecommunications Facilities Task Force. Um, we have submitted uh, a unanimously approved uh, report and recommendations for uh, amendments to the zoning ordinances that would help the town comply with the Telecommunications Act of 1996 while still allowing the town some flexibility to regulate the uh, construction and placement of telecommunication facilities in the town. Um, 
I think that the, the report that we submitted and the recommendations are fairly detailed, and uh, unless the council has any questions, I, I won't really go through them at all. I would, um, for public record, like to thank the following people who uh, helped put this together. Um, Don Barrett, who brought a lot of hard work and common sense to the committee. Uh, Larry Clough, uh, whose legal expertise was very helpful, um, especially when I agreed with him. Uh, <laughs> Peter Cotter, uh, who shared with us the, the insights and the ways of the planning board, which was very important. Uh, Bob Howe, who had a lot of technical expertise and very good input and advice. Uh, and of course, uh, Mr. Bill Jordan and Chief uh, McGoldrick uh, served on the committee, and I don't need to detail the, the uh, commitment and public dedication that they bring to all the efforts they participate in with the town. Um, and then a special thanks would, would go to uh, Maureen O'Meara, O'Meara uh, who did a lot of the homework that none of us wanted to do, uh, presented us with a lot of uh, technical information, got in contact with experts that helped us sift through some fairly technical issues. Um, uh, there, there was some, some we, I think we all learned a lot, I certainly did, in, in dealing with this, and it was a pretty interesting area of the, of the law. Um, that said, unless the council has any questions, I would submit the report on behalf of the committee. Thank you, Tom. Before we get to questions, mention if you, we've had the benefit, obviously, of receiving the report. Mention for the benefit of those people who may be watching on television, you're talking towers, antennas, mm. dishes, just so that everyone understands what the subject is. They may not have realized that from the... Well, the, the Telecommunications Act uh, says that a municipality may regulate but cannot prohibit uh, telecommunications technology services uh, from being provided to all the members of a community. Uh, there's a new technology known as uh, PCS communications uh, that has a approximately one and a half to two mile uh, radius from an antenna. So if, if you had a PCS, a, f a phone that ran on PCS technology, you would have to be within the two mile radius of the, the antenna. Um, in order for it to work effectively. Um, because you can't prohibit this technology from being provided to consumers, that means that telecommunication companies have a certain, uh, a certain ability to, to put in their antennas. The most effective antennas go on very large towers. Um, we tried to figure out a way to use existing facilities. Uh, we identified the high points in the town uh, where these things, these antennas could be put up by the telecommunication companies um, so that we could limit to the greatest extent possible the need to build any new towers. Uh, there's also other technologies that these companies can use. Um, they can put small antennas uh, in, in very short distances from one another uh, this is sometimes required because of uh, ledges or hills that, that, that make the, the, uh, the waves inaccessible or down at the bottom of two lights that they may, it may be incumbent on the telecommunications companies to figure out uh, how to reach those people um, because even if you had a very large tower, you wouldn't be able to get down there. So there, there were a lot of considerations that, that we went through. Um, I listened with some envy to the pool committee members because I know that uh, uh, new antennas will not be greeted with the same enthusiasm as a new pool. Um, but at the same time, it's something that the law requires. And I think it's something we all agreed on the committee. I think it's something that, that uh, the uh, citizens of Cape Elizabeth will largely want to be able to purchase these, these technology services. Um, so we tried to balance those interests, um, and that's reflected in our report. Good. Thank you, Tom. Questions from the council? Yes, Council McGinty. Um, I'd like to commend Tom and his committee for the work they've done. Obviously, a lot of work went into this. Um, I know it's a very uh, technical subject matter. Um, and just for the benefit of the public, 
um, they've recommended 14 pages of zoning ordinance amendments. So there's a lot here for us to uh, chew on in the future. Um, and um, I know that we'll be having some lengthy discussions with your, with your committee over all of these recommendations. Um, I would like to uh, acknowledge receipt of this report from the Telecommunications Facilities Task Force and recommend that it be referred to the Planning Board for their review and comment. And is that a, a motion? motion or a second? That was it's a, a motion. motion. Yes, there's a motion and it's seconded by Councilor Berry. Thank you each. Councilor Fritz, further discussion? How, how many um, antennas are we likely to need in the town of Cape Elizabeth from the wireless? Well, that's an impossible yeah. answer to give in terms of raw numbers uh, because a lot of it depends on uh, the, the reach of these antennas depends on how high they are, the topography of where they're placed, um, and other uh, geographical conditions. Um, we uh, reviewed a map that um, sort of roughed out various high points and, and the t what a two-mile radius from those points would be. Um, and in our report, we suggested two overlay districts that incorporate existing tall structures. Um, and those, from the maps and, and from what we've discussed with some of the experts from the telecommunications companies um, would give a lot of coverage to the town. Um, we believe that under the law that would be, those could be enough um, with the telecommunication companies using their technology and their salesmanship um, to put supplemental uh, small antennas uh, in places where they needed to fill the gaps of coverage. Uh, it's, it's up to the town to do everything they can to, to accommodate them, but it's also up to, we believe, it's up to the telecommunications companies to um, make an effort to work with the town to, uh, to help us avoid having to build any uh, or, or allowing the, the construction of any tall towers, which uh, I think would be a pretty difficult sell in most, most instances. I mean, I guess I was kind of surprised to see that, that all the residential zones would be able to have towers, I mean, antennas that um, could be 25 feet over a, an existing roof, if that's my understanding, rather than only limited to, to say, areas. Am I not? Well, that was one of the issues that came up in, in trying to to determine what was an antenna, what was a telecommunications facility, uh, was the recognition that there are many uh, amateur uh, ham radio operators in the town, at least, at least a few readily identifiable ones. Um, and, and we did not want to limit the ability through, uh, through our suggestions for someone to, to put a whip antenna on their their chimney to get better radio reception or to, to put a uh, television antenna on top of their house. Um, and we, we wanted to make sure we had, we, we had that covered in our suggestions and recommendations so that um, those would be regulated as well, but they would not be barred by, by specifying regulations for the large telecommunications facilities. Other questions for Tom? Yes, Council Berry. Uh, Tom, uh, I'd like to echo uh, Council McGinney's uh, uh, comments on your good job. A Thank lot you of work in this thing. Uh, I just I noticed on your map and reading through, uh, you have two areas designated. One's off uh, near the Wells Road, and the other was in Shore Acres. Is that where the water standpipe is? Yes. Is that what you had in mind? Yes. So that you, uh, on top of the water standpipe, you'd put an antenna there? Yes. That, okay. And then, Are we actually. Um, Maureen discussed that with the uh, Portland Water District, and right. that's something they would be uh, agreeable to. It's okay with them. And, and uh, they make money off it. You know, the telecommunications companies would have to pay them to rent their space. Okay. And, and what about the, uh, the, the one uh, near the Wells Road on uh, Spearwing? Uh, that is where there's the existing uh, towers on the Strout property. Okay. Thank you. 
Other questions? Councilor Groff. Um, Mr. Chairman, since this is simply the receipt of this report tonight and knowing that our planning board will be asking many questions and knowing that we'll be probably having a workshop and going over this in detail, I would call a question at this time and move this along. So moved. The, uh, the uh, proposal from, I think it was John, it was Councilor McGinney's and supported by uh, Councilor Berry was to accept or receive this uh, uh, nicely done work. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. And to hand. refer it to the planning board. And, yeah, yes, as originally read. Uh, any against? Seeing none. Tom, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate the hard work. Thanks. Okay, thank you. We will now move to item number 25, quit claim deed. Mike, would you care to comment on that? Yes. Uh, <coughs> this property was foreclosed upon quite a few number of years ago. The Deborah Lane, who does an exceptional job uh, uh, with all of the tax liens and perfecting our property tax system, uh, mm. has outlined this process. Uh, this was an elderly couple who lived in the property, were unable to pay the taxes. Uh, they've uh, passed away over the last couple of years, and uh, it's now in the estate. The estate forwarded us a check for all of the past due taxes, uh, fees, etc. And I'd encourage you to authorize the quick claim deed. Uh, this is an example of the town, you know, sympathetically looking at a at a at a situation and uh, trying to help people through a difficult time in their life. Is there a motion in regard to this, Councilor Gross? So moved. Is there a second? Second, second. Councilor Reed. Any further discussion? It's hearing none. We'll move to the vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. Any against? It passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Moving to item number 26, uh, quick presentation on the Levitt property. Mike. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I wrote a brief memo to the council on this. I won't reiterate it. Things are going fine. We have had a, one or two surprises, uh, nothing major, nothing that's going to be alarming at all. Uh, we have looked at the, the structures on the property, the barns and the homes, and our feeling is due to safety concerns uh, with access to the properties and possible fire hazards as well if they caught fire and uh, it could spread to you know adjacent lands and buildings potentially that it that it is beneficial for us to remove the buildings as soon as possible uh, one of the the homes on the property there's, there's two homes uh, is listed on the town's historic list mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that it's uh, as any particular uh, historic significance. Uh, some of you may have read the story in yesterday's paper about Betty Davis's old house. Uh, you know, this, uh, we also, <coughs> just at that property, we sent notice to uh, Gerald Shuttleworth about it. Uh, he had a comment period, which actually expires on uh, Wednesday of this week, at which he could comment. Uh, we also toured the property with the capabilities of the Preservation Society representatives. The president, uh, Connie Murray, Carol Fritz was there. Uh, a few other people came along, uh, and they recognized as well that the property is really beyond repair at this point. But they encouraged us that some of the doors are interesting and that we ought to try to preserve those uh, as much as possible. Uh, the, the piece over the door that could be saved, as well as some of the barn beams. Uh, the, the way this is worded is that we're going to try to save some of the barn beams, but you know they're, they're difficult to safely get out. So what we're going to try to do is first to knock them on in such a way that we can hook onto those beams and pull them up. Because one, they have some value, and uh, two, it's, it's just be too bad to, to lose them. So what I'm, I'm looking for, you know, I, I don't feel right demolishing town buildings without council authorization. Uh, but what I'm looking for is authorization to take those buildings uh, down uh, just as soon as the asbestos uh, that we did expect to find uh, is removed. Is there a motion to so authorize? Also Councilor motion. Reed. Yes, sir. Moved. Second. Seconded by Councilor Fritz. Any further discussion? Yes. There are some, you did mention the preserving some of the trees that are there because mm -hmm. there, there's a very, very nice stand of, and they're shag bark hickory trees mm -hmm. um, that are very close to some of the buildings. And are you pretty optimistic that with taking some down with equipment that are near the trees and then using it for training for the fire that you can save all of that clump of hickory trees the 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 plan would be is to push <laughs> that building it's the old it's the newer of the two homes right. away from that tree so that 
you know, there's, there's one clump in particular that's really right. a beautiful tree. Uh, we, we will try to save that. It's just a, it's a beautiful tree. But the plan would be to move that building just to the side and then burn it uh, before it catches big time fire. We might, we might do some experimental within some uh, training, but then before we have the big burn, we'll try to push it away from the tree. Good. Thank you, Councilor Fritz. Is it also fair to say for the public, Mike, that uh, in the meantime, the public is not invited to wander through those buildings? That's correct. And we're, we're also, uh, Wednesday is it, Bob? Yeah, Wednesday we're putting up a temporary gate onto the property uh, to discourage vehicular access uh, down there in there. Uh, it's very, we, we don't want vehicles in there for the reasons we've stated. Plus, uh, it's a very long dead end and there, there are People, if they went in at night, could very easily find themselves mired uh, in Janet McLaughlin style. Uh, Elizabeth Frams, where she went with the police cruiser uh, many, many years ago. That's a long story. Uh, <laughs> I think there's some real danger in those real, barns. There's some real danger. Yeah, there's been danger in the barns, but also people drove in there. So, mm -hmm. you know, in, people really should stay off the property until uh, the wetland survey is done. There's some stakes there that we're trying to make sure we get GPS before they remove and there's some, some other, there's tons of poison ivy too. I began to walk through some until I got yelled at, so I began to feel it the next couple of days. So, I'd, yeah, I'd stay away from there until the poison <laughs> ivy's gone anyway. Any other discussion? Hearing none, we'll move the, the uh, motion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any against? Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. <coughs> Moving to item number 27, recommendations from town manager. Uh, family Fun Day. Mike. Yeah, Family Fun Day was a great success. I go into a long story here about the fireworks. Uh, they won't be rescheduled. Uh, I, if anyone wants to complain about that decision, they're welcome to call me at any time. I'd be happy to, to talk about it. Uh, the, the, the great news, though, is that the committee, uh, I think, is, is the strongest committee we've ever had. Not only the people who've been officially appointed, but also some people who, who come to all the meetings and participate in the activities. And Family Fun Day always was sort of a, a loose committee in terms of who came, but it'd be nice to really recognize the folks who, who do do all the work and actually have them listed as members of the committee. There's nothing that says the committee just has to have seven people, so I would encourage you to add the three individuals who are mentioned here uh, to the committee so that they're properly recognized for their activity. Councilor Reed. Uh, yes. As the uh, chairman of the Appointments Commission, I do appreciate the fact that the town manager has, again, helped us uh, meet some obligations and that uh, the town council vote to have uh, the Family Fund Day Committee um, expanded to include now 10 individuals, including the three that I will name, uh, Marnie Sousa, Catherine Kelsey, and Debbie Butterworth to the current seven uh, that are serving. Is there a second to that? Second. Councilor Watson, thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any nays? It passes. I just have another question. Oh, it passes unanimously, yes. Another point, Councilor Reed. Uh, just that although the committee has now been extended to 10, we do encourage members of the public who have special interests and are willing to volunteer to approach members of the um, Family Fund Day Committee and to make their interests known because there are many opportunities to help. Thank you. Uh, citizens discussion I believe we've already had. Uh, item number 28, uh, the chair would entertain a motion to move to executive. Oh, yes. But before you did that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask the council's indulgence. Uh, we received in Friday's mail from Central Maine Power Company uh, <coughs> two documents. Uh, one is a contract for residential line extension, and the second is for an easement deed. What these are is part of the ball field project at Lions Field and as part of the development of a house in, in the back property that's unrelated to the town, but that, but that there's been a historic right-of-way to since the 1800s. Uh, that house is, is about to become constructed. We also are putting in the electrical line for the concession so that we're not digging up the road at the same time. CMP actually requires an easement in order to uh, allow that electric line to go in. They also require us to sign the residential line extension and what, what this is, it's a little under $3,000 that we're actually paying as part of the original contract was approved by the planning board in order to do this. And this is just the pro forma 
uh, that I'm requesting is you to take out an item out of order, just authorize me to sign these pro forma documents, which are part of the, the original plan that the council already reviewed and approved. Is there a motion for said authorization? Councillor Reed? Yes. Uh, second? Yes. Councillor Groff? Any further discussion? Uh, yes, Councillor McGinney. Just let me understand this. The $3,000 is to extend the line to our concession stand at, line, at the line, at the play field. Plan. That's correct. It's, uh, CMP has calculated the relative shares of each party, and okay. that is our share. All right. Okay. That's fine. Other discussion? Yes, Councillor Frick. It's a concession stand at which playing field? Lions. I don't remember hearing that there was a concession yeah, stand. The, 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 the hope is, is to have a concession stand that would serve both fields at the same time. To have power for, you know, if they ever wanted a PA system for an event that we, that we don't want it on a recurring basis, but uh, they would like to have the power there for equipment maintenance, you know, all that type of thing as well. But has the concession stand been approved? The concession stand Already itself in some is other not. Form? That, that would need to be an amendment to go to the planning board for site plan approval. But the electric line, in terms of long-term planning, was part of the plan, was shown on the plan, and is required to be installed if we're to be in conformance with the planning board site plan approval. Other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Uh, I see six, uh, seven approved. Any nays? No. Okay, thank you. Mike, you have authorization to sign. Those, there were two motions there. One was to take it out of order and one was to approve it. It was implicit in my motion. <laughs> yes, I thought that I heard Councillor Groff say that very clearly. Implicit. Okay, are we now ready for item number 28? Thank you for that indulgence. I move we go into executive session. Uh, would you exp uh, elaborate on the two reasons why, please, Councillor Berry? For the purpose of reviewing an application for a hardship abatement on taxes and also to discuss the status of collective bargaining on the personal Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Seconded by Councillor Watson. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Raise your hands. All yes, seven yeses. Any nays? No. Thank you very much. It is not anticipated that we're going to return, is it? No, no you, you may have a vote, but it's not. It, it would be, if anyone wanted to find out what the vote was, they could call. Okay. So you, you may return to public session for a vote, but it wouldn't be televised. All right, so the TV will go off, and they could read in the paper or call up to they find out what we do. You. That would be on the hardship abatement issue, and not on the collective bargaining issue. Right. Thank you all very much. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Will they know on www capeelizabeth.com tomorrow morning? If they, yes, they will. Thank Is it dot .com or dot .gov? It's com. com. Very good. Communication. Well, you know, fourth time. It has to be. You're right. The, the people can 